Okay. Uh, so Lee Chang will be speaking to us about tales and moments of uh, stochastic PDEs. So go ahead, Lee Chang. All right. Thank you, Ivan. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for coming. Uh, I guess before I start, I should have a disclaimer, which was already discussed before the talk, which is that next week there's going to be a symposium, uh, probably symposium hosted by the, the Bermuda Society. I'm going to be a talk there, and this is going to be an identical talk to that one. And for that reason, you might find this contents of this talk to elementary. Still, um, I hope you'll find something useful in this talk. All right, so with that said, I'm going to start. All right, so this talk is about two aspects of some examples of stochastic PEEs. And particularly, we're going to talk about tail probability and moments of, uh, of these PEEs. So um, we're going to look at specifically these two stochastic partial differential equations. So let me start from the left. OK, so this is the cardot paris john equation it was proposed by these three physicists in the mid 80s. And it was proposed as a model for random surface graphs. All right. So here is the drawing. So you have this zigzag thing, which represent the interface of some growing phenomena at some given time. Now the thing is dynamic, so it depends on this parameter, this this variable t here, t is time. And for most part of this talk, I'm gonna work in one space dimension. So x is the spatial variable. Okay. Though at the end of the talk, I'm gonna dive into two dimension briefly. Okay, so this is a height function. Now, how does this equation evolve? Well, one thing I noticed is that on the right-hand side of the equation, there's this driving force, you see, this is the space-time y noise. So, you know, the precise definition of it is, of course, it's a um, Gaussian process with delta correlation function. But what you should think about is, is this, there's some random ambient force that is driving the whole process to grow. So one way to just imagine it is you could imagine that if snow is being falling from the sky. This, or another way to think about it is if you are growing a substrate in a lab, this is the gaseous molecule that is being bombarded onto a given substrate. Now on top of this ambient force, the height, the, the physical system has two intrinsic mechanisms to respond to this ambient force that correspond to this gross phenomenon. These two physical mechanisms are being modeled by the two terms on the right-hand side. One of them is this Laplacian term, which is a local smoothing effect. So what that is saying is that locally, this high function has a tendency to just smooth it out a little bit. And here comes this quadratic terms. This thing uh, sometimes called lateral growth, I'm going to call it slope dependent growth. So what it, this term is saying is that um, there is the, the local, um, the speed of growth somehow depends on the local average slope at a given, given place. Now what you're seeing here is a particular function of the slope, which is the quadratic function. How is that? Well, let's say instead of considering the quadratic function and consider a generic, generic function of the slope, f, which, where f is a generic function of the local slope, well, I'm just going to tear expand it. Is there a question? No, I think somebody had un been unmuted. All right, so here's this physics um, heuristic that says, okay, I'm going to consider generic function of the slope, but I'm just going to tear expand it. Okay, here comes a constant. Well, the constant you can kill by just having an overall shift of your uh, gross velocity. Whereas for the linear turn in the slope, you can kill it by having a Galilean transformation where you travel at a non-zero velocity. You can kill this term by having a change of coordinate frame. Therefore, this quadratic turn is the first non-trivial turn that you see from slope dependent growth. And that was proposed by KPZ to be uh, a model for this kind of random surface graphs. So that is the phenomenology behind KPZ equation. Now, on the right hand side, we have a different equation, the stochastic heat equation. So what you see right off the bat is the good old heat equation, again, in one space dimension, but now it's being driven by this, again, space on y noise, the same thing, multiplicatively, it's multiplying the solution, okay? So this is the stochastic heat equation. So what is the underlying uh, physical phenomena first model by such equation? It comes out in many different places. And one particular one I want to point out is uh, directed polymer in a random environment. 
So what happens here is that you can view this C as an external force, and you write the solution by using feynman cat formula, just pretending that C itself is a well-behaved um, potential. So this is the feynman cat formula that expresses a solution as an integral. Now, this integral itself has interpretation in terms of drag a polymer in a random environment. How, how does that go? Well, here you see a picture of some noisy dot. That is supposed to represent the effect of this noise permeating in space and time. And what you do is, if you want to know the value of z at time t, you start from that position and you send a Brownian motion backward in time. And this Brownian motion is going to pick up the effect of this random noise. It's going to accumulate them and put it exponential. And then at the end, you pick out whatever initial data you have for, at a place where you end up with. And then you take average over all the Brownian motion. That's what this formula is saying. So through feynman katz formula, we see that the solution to stochastic heat equation is somehow related to this physical uh, system. And in a more formal way, it says that the solution to stochastic heat equation is the partition function of this directed polymer model. OK. So there it is. On the left, you have random surface growth. On the right, you have um, polymer. These are two stochastic differential equations that are good on their own right. But how are they related to each other? Well, one thing that comes to mind goes back a long time in history. If you look at just the non-random part of the equations of the PDs, just ignore the noise for a moment. Well, then what was known since the 1940, since 1949 is that the two equations can actually, the solution to, to these two equations actually related to each other in a very simple way. If you exponentiate H, what you get is a solution of the heat equation, and this is a hot core transformation. And there's nothing you know, this is just something you can check directly by calculus. It was proposed as a way to solve Berger's equation. Now, with the presence of the noise, you can still do this calculation formally. And what you end up with is that the solution to KPZ equation transformed into the solution of stochastic equation through this exponentiation. Now, there's a little caveat, because the truth is that cardinal parisi john equation itself is actually not well posed in the usual sense. The reason is that um, the solution here, as you can see here, is very rough. And we know how rough it is, it's as rough as Brownian motion. It's earlier a half minus, but not, not better. So the derivative in this gradient of x uh, in h is at best a distribution, and squaring make it very um, problematic. And there are theories uh, among which are uh, regularity structure and parallel control theory, which you can make rigorous of this equation and then you know, explain how this hopf coach transformation works. However, just because of reason that hopf coach transformation formally take the KPZ equation to a stochastic equation, we're being offered an alternative definition of the KPZ equation. Namely, we can just define what it means to be a solution of SHE and declare that solution of KPZ is log of Z. Okay, so this is the notion of solution we're going to work with, the goes under the name of half solution. So for the stochastic heat equation, you don't have this uh, nonlinear term. However, the solution still here, I have to, I want to emphasize here that the behavior of solution of the SHE is still quite nonlinear. And the reason is that the noise here to see doesn't come in a, in a linear fashion. The solution Z itself is also a function of to see. So precisely, you know, I, to be more precise, the solution of stochastic heat equation is still a nonlinear process. Yeah, because it's written in such a form, you can recast the equation in Duhamel, I put Duhamel principle into integral equation, and you can iterate that, uh, that integral equation into a series. It just so happened that in one space dimension, this series converged very nicely. Hence, we have a standard theory to make sense of the solution of the stochastic heat equation. And we're just going to define the solution of the KPZ equation as um, h equals log of z. Okay, so this is a notion of solution that we're going to work with. Now, um, in this talk, I'm going to focus on one particular aspect, a quantitative aspect of the KPZ equation. Namely, I'm going to ask a question of what is the tail probability, what is the large deviation of the solution to this random growth phenomenon, and Toward the later half of the talk, there's something I want to convey to you, which is that somehow this, um, this 
phenomena can be accessed through the help of understanding the moment of stochastic heat equation. So put it differently, Hopf code transformation does not only provide an easy way to make sense of KPZ equation. Toward the later half of the talk, I'll, I hope I'll be able to convince you that this connection between the two equations also produce something that is very precise about the quantitative behavior of the equations. Okay. Okay. Um, so most result in this talk is going to be for a very specific inertial data, though there are some generalization which I'll mention along the way. Okay. So this specific initial data is uh, more easily described in terms of stochastic heat equation here on the upper right. So I'm just going to start uh, the stochastic heat equation for most of the time from a delta at zero. And remember that the solution of KPZ is a log of stochastic heat equation. And so it's the corresponding initial data is just log of that, except you can't take log of a delta function. So what, what does that mean in terms, of, uh, in terms of the KPZ equation for the initial data? When you think about stochastic heat equation, when time is very small, the noise wouldn't have kicked in, wouldn't have played much effect. So when time is very small, it's as if you're just solving the ordinary heat equations. And we know the solution of that. The solution is just a good, good old heat curve. Okay. So we expect that when time is very small, the solution on the stochastic heat equation side looks like just a heat kernel. And you take a lot of that, and you just work out the mass. You'll, you'll realize that uh, if I take this and let T very small, the initial data looks like a very sharp parabola. Okay. And hence the name narrow wedge. So the corresponding phenomena is that I start from such a narrow wedge and then start to grow the random surface. All right, so I run this for a long amount of time. I want to know what's happened in the long run. So um, here is a schematic drawing of the random surface growth from such initial data, presumably after a long period of time. Okay, I want to know how does the height function behave in, in, in a time, in, yeah, in a later time. Well, my, I take my favorite point, x equal to zero, and ask, what is the distribution of the height at that point? Well, so following the standard classical paradigm of probability theory, you can ask a question about, is there a centering? Is there a low large number? Is the concentration of such a random variable? Is there a characteriz characterization like the central limit theorem uh, for such a random variable, you can ask what about the tail? What is the law? What is the large deviation? The first two questions are answered around 2010. Uh, in particular, the theorem of Emil Korn and Costello states that uh, at some later time, there's a very precise characterization of the growth velocity, which says that the whole thing goes down at velocity 1 over 24, and hence the centering factor here. So, Overall, we know where the height function roughly is at a later time. Not only that, it says that the width of the distribution, the fluctuation of the height at a later time grow like t to the one third. If you scale down everything accordingly, there's a limit distribution of the height, which is not Gaussian, which is the GUE Tracy Widen distribution that comes out of the largest eigenvalue of the GUE random matrix. And this result was simultaneously derived by three other physicist groups um, and also recently be extended to process level by, uh, by the work of Costello and Shakar. All right, so that settles the, piece, the business of you know, law of, the analog of law of large number and central limit theory. And the focus of this talk is naturally the next level question, which is large deviations. We want to know what is the tail probability of such a thing? What is the chance I'm seeing the growth is anonymously large or anonymously small? Well, by the common wisdom of large deviations, we know that the probability of such a thing happening is typically exponentially small. And more precisely, we expect that the growth is anonymously of scale t larger than its typical value is of order probability of exponential minus t and lower by probability exponential minus t squared. So the probability, this, these are the rates of the, uh, of the tail. Now right off the bat, you notice something peculiar, which is that the rates are asymmetric. Although the probability of seeing both tail events are very small, it's much more unlikely to see upper deviation than lower deviation. Now, those of you who are familiar with random matrix, 
are not unfamiliar with this phenomenon. Like uh, a lot of the bulk limit of random matrix ensemble have this asymmetric tail behavior. Now, in the current context of KPZ and its stochastic heat equation, I can offer another phenomenological explanation, not exactly how the value of the rates, but why the rates are asymmetric from directed polymer. Okay, so here it is. Now remember I told you that uh, the stochastic heat equation can be realized through feynman cast formula, which is written here, I'm circling, um, as the partition function of this random polymer in, in a random environment. Now you ask yourself, what is a scenario that will cause the z and hence h? Remember, z is equal to exponential h through half group. What is the scenario of a de deviation that will cause h and z to be anonymously larger? Well, what about what about if I just make the noise anonymously large in a you know thin corridor along space and time? Well. Those Brownian motion that visit this corridor often enough would already pick up this anomaly and hence make you know the partition function z or h bigger than it should be. Okay, so that's one, that's one scenario that you can make the height function or partition function uh, or z much bigger. On the other hand, if you want to pull off the same stunt when you want a lower deviation, this kind of trick won't work. Why? Because the quantity is being exponentiated. So even if you have some anomaly that is small within a small region, the exponential won't feel. So in order to have the thing to be anonymously smaller than its typical value, you have to have the noise smaller than its typical value throughout a huge region in space and time. Hence, it's much harder to make it smaller than, than, than bigger. Okay. I hope that heuristic at least give you some hints why the rates are asymmetric. Now, we can move on to ask the next level question. We have the rate, but what is the actual precise uh, factor of the probability that multiply that's appearing in exponential? Then we, I want to know what is the probability, uh, the small probability that depends on how far away the deviation is. Okay, so this quantity phi plus and phi minus are the rate function that characterizes this probability, and they are being schematically shown up here in the in this figure I'm unboxing here. Okay. Now, what do we know about these rate functions? Well, one thing that we know by just some common, common heuristic is that because we know the fluctuation, the center of this distribution converges to Tracy Whedon distribution, the result I mentioned on the last slide, it is not crazy to expect that the rate function should have similar behaviors as those rate functions of Tracy Whedon distribution when you are close to the center. In particular, from knowledge, uh, prior knowledge in random matrix field, we know that the Tracy Whedon distribution have this very precise rate function. On the lower end is one over 12 cubic law, and on the upper end is this three half law. So just by, by uh, the knowledge that the fluctuation converges to Tracy Whedon distribution, we expect something should, uh, you know, this kind of approximation should happen for this rate function. So this is like in the context of Crimean theorem, no matter the exact rate function depends on the underlying random variable, but no matter what is a random variable, as long as it has, you know, it's fit into the context of Crimea theorem, then the second derivative, uh, it's, it's approximately quadratic near the minimum. Okay. Now, moving on, some physicists predict that not only, peculiarly, not only is it true that um, this approximation hold, this three half approximation hold near its minimum, this group of physicists um, actually predict that the entire rate function, upper tail rate function, is exactly as that of the Tracy Williams distribution, namely this three half law extend all the way throughout the upper tail. As for the lower tail, there's a prediction that going back to, uh, to 2007 and developed by other physicists that use um, a different approach, which initially is thought only to work in short time, but somehow persists in long time that predicts there is this peculiar five half law when you probe very deep into the deep tail. Okay, so we have some sort of rough idea of what the thing should look like. Um, and the theme of this talk is to present to you a mathematical result on, on this front. Okay, so here comes the first result. This is a joint work with Shine Das. 
So here we prove uh, the physics prediction that indeed the entire upper tail is given exactly by this three half power law. So this is the large deviation that's been stated here. And this result has recently been generalized by uh, Pramit and Year to general initial conditions. So here we're working with narrow wedge. It has been generalized by Pramit and Year to, ge to general initial condition and general generalized by Year to half space geometry. And I believe Shyang and Shyang is giving a presentation about this work in next week's symposium. Actually, the talk is already online. And then you're giving a, a presentation about this talk in next week's symposium. So uh, if you're curious, you can take a look. All right. So this result confirms the physics prediction. Now, um, I want to say a little bit about what we actually proved. So, it is well known that for large deviation, characterizing the rate function of large deviation is morally equivalent to characterizing the limit of the moment generating function. So instead of looking at just the large deviation, I could alternatively look at this quantity here, which is the center moment generating function, uh, actually log, center log moment generating function of the random variable I'm interested in. If I can get my handles on that, then through the standard uh, Legendre duality, I can recover the other one. Namely, more precisely, we can prove this statement here. Then the other statement is just by Legendre transformation. The rate function is the Legendre transformation of the limit of the moment generating function. And that's what we did. So we actually proved that give pretty precise um, bounds on this quantity here and leverage into showing the upper the entire upper tail. All right, let me tell you a little bit about uh, what goes on into the proof. I won't show you too much of the details, but I want to give you a taste of what something like this uh, can, can be done. All right, so first and foremost, there is a precise formula that gives us a lot of information about the distribution of the stochastic heat equation and KPZ equation, which I'm circling here. Now, this formula is, um, is shown in this previous, in, in, was derived in this result that I showed you earlier about Tracy Whedon fluctuation. In fact, this formula is the backbone of those results. Once you have this formula, you can go on and show and, and prove the uh, Tracy Whedon fluctuation. Well, so let me walk you through this formula. So what's seen here on the middle, in the middle, is the Laplace transform. If you view this ex expectation as an integral, it's the Laplace transform of this random variable Z it got expressed as the Fredholm determinant of some very explicit kernel, which written down here, the AI is the alley function. Now, the precise form of these functions are not going to be relevant for, for the purpose of this talk. The point here is that some very explicit and workable formula. In, in particular, um, by general probability theory, it says that if I have um, a characterization of the, for, of the Laplace transform, in principle, I have a characterization of the entire distribution. Namely, here I have expression of the Laplace transform of Z, and that would already tell me I have a full characterization of the probability distribution of this random variable I want, I'm, I'm interested, in, and through half call, also the probability distribution of H. Okay. But having expression of the Laplace transform is one thing. Being able to extract useful information from such a formula is another thing. So for example, the previous Tracy Whedon result I show you proceed by analyzing the behavior of this kernel under the fluctuation and show that converges to the so-called every kernel under the fluctuation scale. And here I'm showing you another example. How do you extract upper tail of the KPZ equation from such a form? Well, first of all, through half cost transformation, the moment generating function of the height function got expressed as just the piece moment of the stochastic heat equation. So just once again, of course, says e to the h is equal to z, and hence the moment generating function is nothing but the piece moment of z. How do you extract a moment from moment, gener uh, from moment generating function? Well, this, if p were integer, then you know how to do it. You simply take this Laplace transform here and take the derivative in u however many times and set u equal to zero. That's a standard way to extract moment from moment generating function. Here, however, we need to do this for all positive numbers p. Well, as it turns out, there is a generalization of that fact I just told you. 
uh, extracting moment from moment generating function for even non-integer moments. So here's this, this is a standard, I shouldn't call it standard, this is a last standard formula, which is the analog of what, what I just described. And the proof is actually very standard. So what this allows you to do is to take an explicit formula of the moment generating function, in which in this case is expressed as a Fraunhofer determinant, and plug it into this formula and develop a perturbative series uh, out of which you can do all kinds of analysis and eventually that leads up to this result. Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say much more about um, the proof of this result. And I hope you know, I give you a rough idea of how, how things like this is being proved. So let me move on to the lower, the, the, the other result, the lower tail. Okay, um, so as I mentioned earlier, there has been earlier physics prediction about uh, the deep lower tail and, and solo tail behavior, this five half law and cubic law transition. As it turns out, um, we know exactly what is the entire rate function, this uh, oddly specific rate function that's being given here. So actually, as of today, we know the entire crossover of behavior of the lower tail through this very explicit formula. And this is a theorem I proved uh, in 2018. So you look at the lower tail and you know, appropriate scaling, this thing converges to this um, explicit rate function. Now I should also mention that this result has been derived several times in physics literature, these, these four results here, and one of which I'm involved, and has two existing uh, rigorous proofs. Um, and there's a, another result I want to mention, which is um, an early result by Ivan and Parmit, which give precise bound on the lower tail probability that in particular shows, demonstrate this phi half to um, cubic crossover behavior. All right, so on the next slide, I want to just also tell you a little bit about what goes into the proof. So the starting point is again, this very useful formula that characterize the um, Laplace transform of Z or, or this expectation of the KPZ equation in terms of a flat home determinant. Okay, now this is the, you know, the major tool that goes into precise analysis of the KPZ equation. Now I didn't define to you what is a flat home determinant, but from the definition itself, Brahon determinant is expressed by definition as a series expansion of involving the operator. The zeros turn is just one, and the first turn is negative trace, and the second turn is something like a quadratic trace, and you know, and so on and so forth, cubic trace and, and quadratic trace. So you know, you have to take my word for that. That's you know, that's how Brahon determinant is being uh, defined. What happens is that in the upper tail region, this expansion here behaves in a fairly nice fashion. Namely, the terms are ordered uh, by scale. One is much bigger than the trace of the operator and the quadratic trace is exponentially smaller than the trace and cubic trace is smaller, exponentially smaller than the, the second order trace and so on and so forth. So in order to obtain the asymptotic behavior of such, of such a series expansion, you just need to look at the leading order term. In the case of upper tail, because we take derivatives of so this one got killed. So leading term essentially boils down to this trace. And what you need to do is to calculate this trace and argue that all the high order terms don't matter. What happens in the lower tail? Well, what happens in the lower tail is not clear. You can do some back of envelope calculation and you'll see that there's no nice ordering among all these terms. In particular, trace is actually much bigger than one. And there's, some very subtle cancellation among all these terms within this expansion. And it's, it's just a hard problem to deal with in analysis. And as a matter of fact, this is not a real phenomenon. Um, for those of you who are familiar with you know, random matrix theory, this dual behavior of fraction determinant is very common and prevalent. And in fact, there's a whole industry of, of method that build around such an issue. And what I have just shown you is one particular example of such kind and how people manage to care about it. Okay, so in the next slide, I'll give you a rough idea of how one of, um, how, what is one way to overcome such a challenge. So most of the approach that are available uh, to get around such a problem seeks to not tackle the issue, namely, 
It says that this series behaved poorly in the region I'm probing, in the lower tail region I'm probing. Let me try to look at something else. If there is something else that got expressed, you know, that can express this quantity in a nicer fashion, then I'm gonna use it. So here it is. So this is a result of Alexei Avendin from 2016. Um, by using the cyclic property of the Fahon, by using the cyclic property of determinant, they took this determinantal expression in the middle and rewrite it into something else. And as it turns out, that something else actually give a more uh, amenable access to doing large deviations. All right, now before I'm able to explain that, I have to unpack this slide. There's a lot going on here and I'll try to walk with you slowly. Okay, so what's being said here is that this fraction determinant can be expressed as the expectation of some observable involving this random point process lambda i here. So what is this lambda? Well, it's some point process on a real line. There's a semi-infinite semi point process starting with lambda one and going all the way to infinity. And this is nothing but the space reversal, the space reverse every point process. Uh, it comes up in random matrix as the scaling limit of the spectral edge of Gaussian unitary ensemble. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to realize it as something else that is equivalent. And this is due to the work of Ramirez, Vida, and Virag. These lambdas can also be realized as the eigenvalue of a random shorting operator written here. So what you're seeing here is a shorting operator with this linear potential x and a random potential w prime, where w is a standard Brownian motion, namely w prime itself is a spatial Wynos. Okay. So this is a self-adjoint operator acting on L2, and it is you know, it, it is not hard to show that it is, has fully discrete spectrum and the spectrum is bounded from below. So their eigenvalues form, you know, a discrete semi-infinite random point process because W is random. And those eigenvalues of this random shorting operator is exactly the every point process. Okay. So what that is saying here is that the right-hand side is um, exponentiation of some very specific function f which is written here, and exponentiation of that taking expectation. And that thing is equal to um, an expectation that relates to the KPZ equation. I like to have a cartoon that, you know, that sort of uh, encode the, this equation on the right-hand side. So this F is just some specific cost function. And for the purpose of this talk, uh, you're not going to, you, you don't have to worry about exactly what it is. Uh, the only thing that's going to matter is this function is non-zero up until a point that depends on both u and t and approximately zeros out after that. So up until a point that depends on both u and t, it approximately zeros out. And that is the cost function that's being plugged into this exponential. On top of that, you have this point process, which I'm laying down here, with a density that's growing as you move toward up. All right, so that's what's you know, being written here on this slide. Let me try to you know, take one step back and then just try to uh, orient what is going on here. What is it saying is that even though we are dealing with um, the tail behavior of KPZ equation on the left, through some algebraic mappings and, 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 and formulas, somehow such a quantity got expressed into another stochastic system, which is the area point process or the stochastic area operator. Now, I've already, these two subjects are not re related to each other, but through this formula, I can connect one of the observable into another. Now, the one on the left is a question, is a quantity of interest. It relates the tail of the KPZ, which I want to know. On the right is another quantity that goes, that's arising in the context of stochastic area operator, which presumably I have more handles on. Okay, so here's what comes next. I'm going to use the knowledge on the every side to see if I can, I can squeeze anything out of the large deviation. In order to explain that, I'm going to appeal to an idea of, in the paper of Ivan and Pramit, which I mentioned earlier, that shows the crossover power law behavior. So what is the idea? Well, if you take a look at the quantity on the right-hand side, it's exponential of this function f, which is positive. So this quantity could be small because for those eigenvalues, those points lambdas, that is being 
picking up this, this cost function and being exponential with this negative sign, that's going to cause this quantity to be exponential negative and hence small. So I have a cost just by the way this observable being posed. I have this cost function that drives the whole thing to be very small. What is one way I can avoid the cost? Well, one way I can avoid the cost is just I push all these every point process, this, this point, these eigenvalues, beyond the place where the function, the cost function approximately vanished. Oh, once I've done that, I basically accumulate no cost. I have to pay a penalty because these points don't like to be pushed. There's this notion of level recursion from random matrix that tells you that these eigenvalues really like to be spaced out. So if pushing them beyond that point would only occur with a very small probability and the language, I like to think of it as some sort of penalty. So on the left, you have a situation where you don't have penalty, but you pay a lot of costs. And on the right, you have a situation where you don't have costs, but you pay a lot of cap penalty. And these two scenarios can be calculating using knowledge of random matrix theory. And if you go to do this calculation, as it turns out, uh, this will give you this precise detail of phi half law. And this one will give you this cubic law. And among the results that's been shown in this paper is that it turns out when you probe solid tail, it's this scenario on the right that dominate, which produces cubic tail. And we probe very deep tail, it's this scenario on the left that dominate, which produces this five half law. So following this idea, this idea of you know, cause and penalty, you realize that in order to get the full large division, what you need to do is just to look for all possible configurations instead of these two just extreme and search among all possible configurations to see which one will minimize the joint cost and penalty. And let me just say one more word, how is that being done? If you go back and look at how stochastic area operator is being posted, the only place the randomness comes in is through this Brownian motion. So put it differently, all the randomness of these configurations is being controlled by that single Brownian motion. And that's the idea that goes into the proof. If you can figure out somehow this Brownian motion control the deviation, and you figure out what is the best one that will minimize the cost and penalty, and the proof just can proceed that way. Okay, so there was a lot to, 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 go, to go through. I hope I have you know, conveyed to you some of the idea how to, uh, how to get the upper and lower tails of the KPZ equation. All right, so I've got through half of my talk. The talk is tails and moments. So far, it's all about tails, mostly. And on this slide, I'm going to try to explain to you what's the role of moment that comes going into this. Particularly, where does this very nice formula come, come, come from? What I have been demonstrating to you up until this point of the talk can be viewed as an application of such a formula. I apply such a formula to get upper tail and lower tail. So it's still back to the question, where does such a nice formula come from? And I'm going to introduce one of the derivation that bears its root uh, that's originating from physics. Okay, so it goes under the name of replica approach. All right, so my goal is to get a formula, a fair home determinant formula of this quantity, which can be thought of as a Laplace transform of this random variable Z. Well, I just use a good old Taylor expansion. You can Taylor expand this exponential function and just try to write this whole thing in terms of the moment. So if I can get my hands on the moment of Z and try to sum this result, and you know, with good hope, I might be able to get out of it a very nice formula. But the question is then how do I get a good expression, a good formula for the moment of Z? Well, the Z is a solution to the stochastic heat equation. And here comes an observation that dates back to the 80s in physics, in physics community, which is that if I look at the, what's called the mixed joint moment of Z, I take n copies of Z, not necessarily at the same point zero, but generally x1 through xn. I take part of such a quantity. Now it turns out it's solved by partial differential equation written here. And this partial differential equation has a physics interpretation of delta both gas. But for our purpose, it's just this partial differential equation where H is this explicit um, operator here. Now, such a derivation is actually, once you realize you know, this is true, it's actually very easy to derive. This Laplacian term here comes nothing but, comes come directly from the Laplacian term of the stochastic heat equation. 
and then you got this delta function acting as a potential, which comes as the ETO term when you do ETO calculus of the space and y noise. Okay, so this is something you can derive easily from ETO calc. Not only is this a partial differential equation, it's actually a linear partial differential equation. And from linear algebra, we know that if you can get your hands on the eigenvalue and eigenvector of this operator H here, then you would have a good handles on the solution, which would then produce the mole, right? So as it turns out, uh, delta, both bad, sorry, delta both gas falls into the category of quantum integrable system. In particular, what that means is there exists some techniques among them is beta on that, that can diagonalize this operator explicitly. So there are very explicit formula for the eigenvalue and eigenfunction of this, of this operator. And from there, you can derive a very nice multiple counter integral formula for this moment of, of E. And you can, with enough work, and that's an understatement, you can try to massage such a formula into a Fraunhofer determinant. And that's sort of a very rough idea where this thing comes from. Unfortunately, when I said this uh, method originated from physics, I really meant it. So there's an element of this derivation which is not rigorous uh, in itself, which is that the moment itself is actually growing very fast. So the, the first result I showed you uh, earlier about upper tail, it says that this Z, the moment of Z, actually grows like exponential P cube over 12 times t. Now, the result I showed you was a symptotic result, but actually there's a finite time, you know, finite version of it. And actually this result for integer p has also been proved by Ivan and Pramit, um, and also by Xia Cheng using a different method for some other initial data. Okay, anyway, the point is that this moment here is just growing too fast. Even if you have this n factorial here, with n cubed in exponential, there's no way that thing is actually summable. So this approach, while sounding you know, promising, is actually not mathematically rigorous, and that's you know, that, that was what, what, where it came from in physics. But it turns out there's some other, there's some way to make rigorous of this whole approach, in particular in this paper uh, of Alexei Ivan and Sasamoto, uh, which they developed the method of duality that makes rigorous of the whole approach. And uh, what I'm showing here is just one approach of deriving, deriving such a formula. There's this other approach which I did not discuss. Okay, so all I'm trying to tell you on this slide is that there is some relation between moments and those other results that I mentioned to you earlier. And in general, having good understanding of moment of the stochastic equation is able to be, you know, it's beneficial for, for getting precise information of these stochastic PDEs. Now, our curiosity doesn't stop us in, in one dimension. So what I'm gonna tell you for the rest of the talk is what happened then if you look into two space dimensions, okay? So in one dimension, there's a lot of nice property about these, these systems, in particular, the exact solvability either coming from beta on that or other approaches. Unfortunately, such solvability is unlikely to persist into two, two dimensions. So if you look at in particular stochastic heat equation. This is analog of what we were seeing on the previous slides. Uh, it is not known that if there's some you know, analogous exact solubility of such a PDE. And as a matter of fact, this PDE itself is not even well posed. So as it turns out, in higher and higher space dimension, the roughness of the noise gain more weight and to the point which happened exactly in two dimension, that it overcomes the smoothing effect of the heat equation, of the heat, of the heat part of the equation. So um, another way to, to say this is you can try to replicate the solution theory of the stochastic heat equation in one space dimension, write this into Hamilton form and develop a interpretive series. What happens here is that every single turn in that series has infinite second moment, and that is not allowed by the theory. So, so this SPD in itself is right off the bat your post. And the standard way to uh, formulate the problem is then you take a smooth function and you smear out the node a little bit. And here I'm doing this space modification. So put it more precisely, you take a symphonically compactly supported function, you scale that function by radius epsilon, and you convolve it with the Y noise to make it smooth. And accordingly, I'm gonna have epsilon on everything. Okay. 
And now you see what happens, you know, want to see what happened if I gradually remove this modification, if I send F1 to zero, if I can recover some sensible limit. However, as you do that, you have to tone down the strength of the noise. Otherwise, you'll just return to where you started. And if you analyze how this L2, how the second moment diversion I mentioned earlier happens as you tone down, uh, I'm sorry, as you scale F1 to zero, you, you, you see from the calculation that the right thing, the natural thing to do here is to scale down the noise by this factor square root of F. Okay. Now, peculiarly, on top of that, you have to put a, a, a peculiar constant to pi in order to see a non trivial and non Gaussian limit. So it was shown by Caravena, Sun, and Zygurus that if you have this constant here less than 2 pi, uh, there's still some interesting phenomena, but the, the strength of the noise is not enough to support any non Gaussian limit behavior. And all the, in the end, what, you just get a Gaussian limit. And there's some back of envelope calculation that tells you if the constant here is bigger than 2 pi, you don't get any sensible limit. So here we are, we have, you know, we have this situation where you modify the noise and tone down, <clears throat> tone down the size of the noise with this peculiar factor, that factor two pi that just has to be right in order to see a limit. So the question, a natural question, which is a big question, is if you can characterize a limit of the process as F one goes to zero. If we can get analogous uh, process that represents the 2D stochastic equation as F1 goes to zero. Well, as far as I know, this is still a challenging open question. And just to put things into perspective, why such a thing is challenging? Well, this stochastic equation uh, in the language of, in the language of um, SPD is critical at two dimensions. Namely, if you just calculate locally at a small scale, how does the Laplacian scale and how does the noise scale? It turns out they just compete at, exact, at the same footing. And the standard theory, you know, existing theories aren't built to tackle such a situation. Another way to see how the thing is non-standard is that there is a widespread belief that the limiting process that you're seeing here is in fact independent of this noise that you put in. Okay, again, this is mostly conjecture. But it's a belief that the limiting process is somehow genuinely weak in the sense of um, stochastic ordinary differential equation. All right, so, so if that is the case, then it, you know, there's still back to the question of what, what can we say about this SVD. And most of the recent results focus on the limiting moment of, of, of such an equation. In particular, when the case, uh, in the case of second moment, uh, through some radial symmetry, the problem can in fact be reduced to one dimension and these, um, these group of people managed to get an um, expression for a limiting second moment and also was being brought by Bertini and Kincrini into the context of SBDE. And for the case of third moment, you, one can employ what's called um, chaos expansion to try to drive you know, expansion for the moment. And from that moment, you know, some, some hard work, you know, some, some, some hard analysis of manipulating the um, controlling the series, uh, Karaminasun and Zagoras were able to get a uh, limiting thermal. However, because of the critical nature of such equation, um, once you go on higher, higher and higher moments, um, chaos expansion just becomes more and more complicated. Okay, so the last result I want to share with you uh, is a joint work with Yugo and Jeremy Quastel. Here we um, have a unified perspective of showing the convergence and characterizing the limit of any moments. So specifically, if you start from any initial data and you know, you test the moment against any test function, as n, you know, for any n, as f1 goes to zero, uh, we obtain a limit, which is explicit in itself, but it's a little bit complicated. And if you write out the formula, it would actually fit the entire page. So I won't do that. But it got expressed in terms of some sort of Feynman diagram. Okay, I'm not going to get into it. So what is the method that then goes into such, you know, obtaining such a result for any value and any moment? Well, this thing goes back to one of the previous connections I showed you previously in one dimension which is a connection to delta both gas. 
we know that the moment, the mixed joint moment of stochastic heat equation solves this uh, PDE described by the delta Bose gas here. So this is the analog of that in two dimension. And now you can take this and view this as an analysis problem and try to, you know, try to see what you can do. And our work is actually heavily motivated by this previous work of Rajiv and Dimak Rajiv, where they took this problem as a baby version of some sort of quantum field theory and analyzed it from the prism of, of functional analysis. So in particular, instead of looking at uh, the moment in the time domain, they proposed that let's look at this quantity, which is the resolvent, which is nothing but the Laplace transform of the moment. So going from time domain to the zero variable, going from time to Laplace domain. And they show that under different scheme, instead of space modification, they use um, Fourier cutoff, they show that there's a nice con this, the conversion to some very explicit formula of the limiting result. So what we did is that we managed to carry out uh, this convergence in the context of space modification in order to connect with uh, the stochastic PDE. And what then you are able to do is that at a limiting level, you can inverse the Laplace transform going back from Z to the time domain of the limiting formula to get explicit formula in, in, expressed in terms of Feynman diagram of the mole. So what happens here is that uh, despite the very heavy uh, analysis of the chaos expansion in the time domain, once you move into Laplace domain, things greatly simplify. And then now you can use a big hammer of the functional analysis. And once you've done enough work in the Laplace domain, the general theory already tells you that you are guaranteed a convergence in a mom moment, uh, sorry, in a moment in a time domain. And you can invert this Laplace transform not at a pre-limiting level, but only in a limiting level, which allows you to simplify the, the simplify analysis greatly. On top of that, you'll get some very explicit formula, uh, which, which tells you what this quantity is. Okay. So I've basically hit the end of the talk. Um, let me just briefly summarize what happened. So at the beginning of the talk, I show you some result about the tails of, this, of the KPZ equation. And one message I want to get across through, through this discussion is that there's is a connection between a KPZ equation and, and, and stochastic equation. For one thing, Hofkoff transformation gives you a way to define KPZ equation. But more importantly is that this connection between these two opens the door for a lot of machinery that you can use to tease out very precise information, specifically this Fraunhofer determinant formula that comes from, ultimately coming from moment, gives us a lot of handle on getting these, uh, these asymptotics. Now, there are some open questions that I listed here, which, um, which um, can, be, you know, can be explored fuller beyond what has been achieved. So here I'm focused on large time, large time, large deviations. There are other regions that are also interested in, in its own, in particular the short time region when t goes to zero. Now another thing is that um, even though large deviation is known that large deviation is model dependent, the rate function I showed you earlier are depending on what, whatever model you're working with. But there's some, there's some hint that uh, um, Despite being model dependent, there's some universal behavior behind all these kind of rate function, all these kind of large deviation. In particular, this five half tail was first derived in this short time region, but somehow persists into long time region. And there's other general initial data result that I didn't explain to you the detail shows that this Q three half tail is somehow somewhat universal, uh, regardless of the initial data. So there's some universal behavior that seems to be luring behind the scene. All right, so. Moving on to two dimensions, uh, which is a much more uh, unexplored problem. We've shown that the resolvent approach uh, actually can be used to characterize all the moments um, in, in this F1 going to zero limit. And not only is that true, there's this explicit formula, which I didn't show you for the resolvent, that itself is setting the stage for some interesting development. In particular, this physics paper of Rajiv, based on that explicit formula, predicted through some mean field calculation that the nth moment of the object in two dimension grows like this. Okay, so that is on the one hand an open problem, but on the other hand, there's a, like, you know, a nice setup for which the problem can be framed. And characterizing the limit, which as far as known is still an open challenge. All right, 
So um, I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention. All right, well, thank you very much, Li Chang. Let's uh, thank him. Um, <clears throat> we have time for maybe one or two brief questions. Uh, so if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask, feel free. Well, let, let me ask one question about this. So you mentioned this prediction on the nth moment being kind of double exponential in n. So I guess that suggests something about the, the upper tail. But I, I was remembering a paper of numerical simulations of Tim Halpin Healy about two plus one dimensional KPC, where he, he kind of saw that it had the same nature of tails that you have in one plus one dimension. I, do you have any thoughts? Like, I, I guess you're doing a very special scaling here. So is yeah. there some chance that if you do a different scaling, you're going to see similar tails to in one dimension? So, so, so these, these tail behaviors, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say tail behavior, these large moments, and, and being large moment, is very model dependent. If you were be able to, to characterize fractional moment and having exponent going to close to zero instead of infinity, that thing should be more universal. So this, this large end limit is really about this very specific scale. But if you were to look at discrete polymer, it's n squared in two dimensions. And if you look at other models, it's going to be something else. So that end, that large end, end is very model dependent. Any other questions for Li Cheng? Okay, well, so while, while you uh, think about them, you could always come back to his talk next week in the World Symposium. Uh, I sent some links around about that. I'll also send an email later uh, for information about various integral probabilistic aspects of that. Uh, so let's thank Li Ching again for a wonderful talk. And uh, so I'll remind you, so we have uh, Amal Agarwal speaking next and uh, I'm going to close this session, and I just sent a link to the next session. It's also in the email or on the website. And so everyone should just join up that other session in uh, one moment. And so we're going to end this now, and I'll see you in a moment.